first day I arrived here to work for Audubon Society in 1988 in the Keys. And um, so I'm particularly interested. about all the graduate student work that's going on in my lab and also in Jennifer Rehage's lab with respect to dry tropical forests. But Danielle, Suresh, Ramon, Josh, and Lauren will all be presenting on, on their material soon. And so you should look out. So the, the, um, our flora is, is primarily West Indian. And if you look at the range distributions of, of our, uh, of almost all of our plant species, including especially the hardwood hammocks, plants go, the distribution of species tend to go up the coast but not in the interior of the Everglades. And then species are present down here. And so most of them, the center of origin of those genera are in further south. This one is um, Cideroxlon celestrinum, saffron plum. Uh, by the way, these, these maps were made by uh, Elbert Little who was a chief dendrologist of the Forest Service for many years. And they're really fantastic work that, that he did at that time. So in any case, the hammocks in the, in the Keys uh, tend to be on the high, highest elevation. So this is a profile across Key Largo across one part of Key Largo, and the, the units that are ESU 12 and 11 are tropical hardwood hammock. Um, and here's a transect over here. And so they're, they're, for the most part, at least a meter above sea level. Um, and then they, and they're at the top of the, top of the ridge. And in, in Key Largo, in the upper keys, the groundwater is is brackish. So in the lower keys, in the same setting, you might have a freshwater lens there that the hardwood hammock trees might have access to. And the the exactly where they 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 are on the ridge, the further above the the water table that they get, seemingly the more productive the forest is. We know that, I mean, we, we have some data from, in terms of actual leaf production and wood production, but if you, uh, in our lab, we looked at the heights of, of using LIDAR uh, surface elevations and using LIDAR canopy elevations, we looked at the relationship between elevation and canopy height. And regardless of age, um, canopy height increased um, with ground elevation. So there's something going on there. And the hardwood hammocks are not only in the keys, they're also um, embedded in the pine forest and uh, in Everglades National Park. They were embedded in pine forest in Miami-Dade County until there was, now they're embedded in suburbia in Miami-Dade County. And they're embedded in prairie out of the East Everglades like this. So they're, and they're also embedded in the Everglades peatland proper. Um, you'll find a, um, a 
a larger feature which which is a tree island, it's not all hardwood hammock, and the hardwood hammock is just a little a little piece up here at the top. Um, hopefully this is satin leaf hammock, although I doubt it. But this here's um, this is a profile across um, down the length of a tree island uh, near the Shark Valley tram road. And you can see that that the, the highest portion of the island is above a where the rock is is highest, um, and then this is the where the upland forest is, a tropical hardwood hammock. And as you go further down, these are all <coughs> swamp forest trees. And so we find hardwood hammocks in different settings um, throughout South Florida. You have Whole islands in the Keys, where they're, they're the, the dominant uh, vegetation type, and then as fragments um, in the pine forest and in in Miami Dade and in the Everglades. So they're essentially in in favorable settings for for trees, for upland trees. This is this these are small places where the upland can be. And as such, um, the principles of island biogeography would apply. So uh, the same things that uh, MacArthur and Wilson talked about when they, when they discussed island biogeography in the 1960s and brought up the whole concept would, should apply in some sense to uh, these habitat islands, um, which which we have, and, and principle being, everything is based on uh, you have number of species. Number of species is controlled by the balance between the rate of uh, uh, immigration by new species and the rate of extinction. Of old species of, of species that are already on the island, and when those things are in balance, uh, and th so th those processes determine the number of species. And so, if you have a a large island, the extinction rate increases uh, more slowly as the number of species get higher on the island, and therefore the, the, um, the equilibrium number of species is higher. So large islands, you have more, you have more species, small islands, you have less, and far islands, um, you have less immigration, and near islands, you have more immigration. So um, you have a higher number of species. So these two predictions are could be applied to these habitat islands that we have. But the theory of island biogeography doesn't tell us much about what species, what types of species would occur in the islands, which species coexist together, and how do those assemblages change o over space and time. So that's um, what we've been interested in. So this is um, this is a um, what I did uh, with my collaborators Jay and Mary Carrington at Governor State University, and Susanna has been helping a lot with this as well. We gathered a data set. It's a metadata set that. You know, we collected some of the data and other species with the data are species lists from different hammocks um, in different parks in, in, in the county. So we use the IRC data, which is online, and just simply took the, the, the species that were there, their species are either present or absent, and 
Uh, and so in all these fragments, we have a good idea which, which species are present and which are absent. And it's from a, a variety of sources. We also use uh, data from Frank Craighead um, that Frank Craighead collected on Long Pine Key in the 1960s, and we included that as well. And so they, they go um, up in the coastal areas, they go into conservation area 3D. They're in uh, loop unit in Big Cypress, they go down here, and we have some complete species list for hammocks and keys. And if you look at, at that data, um, the prediction of the theory of island biogeography is that um, the species number will increase with, with area. And sure enough, that this is that relationship here. And it's a very tight relationship. So the, the area of the hammock explains 80% of the uh, variation in species number in the hammock. Um, and you also see that the smaller, all these uh, symbols in blue are uh, hammocks in the, the heads of those tree islands that I showed a picture of in Everglades Park. So those are small islands <laughs> small fragments of upland embedded in the swamp forest. And then up, up at the very top, you ha in the Keys, you have some fairly large, you have some fairly large uh, expanses of hammock. For instance, in Key Largo, North Key Largo, hammocks is quite large. And when you do, when you ordinate that data, it, uh, on the ordination, you, it arranges things in geographical regions. So you have, you, we're looking at how similar the composition is. In this ordination, it's telling us how similar composition is from, from one point to another. And you see that this, the composition of the hammocks and the keys, these red dots, are fairly fairly similar and quite different than the composition of the hammocks in the middle of the Everglades. Um, the other symbols, green is uh, hammocks embedded in pine forest and long pine key, and uh, brown is hammocks embedded in prairies in the East Everglades <coughs> and in the Big Site. These up here are conservation area 3D that are quite extreme. So there's a gradient there, and it's a geographical gradient. So what is, and so when you arrange, now in this figure I've arranged um, species, it, this is simply the species by site matrix. These are species along the top, there's about 50 or 60 species, and there's 144 sites. So this is the gradient, and that's, green just means it's present or it's absent in the hammock. So this is kind of an interesting pattern. There's definitely a pattern here. So we don't, in, in the hammocks that have very few species, they're the most, they're the species that occur in many islands. In the hammocks that have many species, they only have, the species they have only occur in, they have some species that only occur there. So when you, we followed an analytical procedure that looks first for uh, coherence, second for range turnover, and third for range boundary clumping. So what that coherence just means you have pattern there's pattern there, and these things could be distributed. There, there could be points all over this species by site matrix um, with no pattern at all, and that would be not coherent. But this is a coherent matrix, and you 
you can test that by uh, doing randomization uh, protocol pr procedures. And we're following here an analytical procedure that was published and they have, we used their program to do it. Uh, and this is actually from the group, uh, Michael Willig was here uh, during the fall and it's his group that, that developed this program. Right? Okay. The second range turnover means that you could have a matrix where species drop out. You have a gradient, you have an environmental gradient. You have species on this side of the, the gradient. And as you move across the gradient, species drop out as species come in. And so that would be, you would have sort of a diagonal pattern where you'd have, you'd fill up the, from this corner to that corner, but the two outsides here would be empty. That would be a, a pattern where you have turnover. But that's not what we have here. We have a nested pattern, which means that there's something, there's some kind of filtering, there's some <coughs> filter that causes uh, these, these sites here to have only these few common species. That's what we want to find out about. The other thing that we actually found in, the, in, this, uh, in this analysis is that there, there, there are actually communities, there, there are distinct communities within, it doesn't necessarily look that way, but you, you have range boundary clumping, so as, as a species does drop out, there's a lot of other species that drop out at the same place along the gradient. So it looks like you have probably four communities, one being this group up here, one being a group like this, one being a group like this, and one being down here. And those groupings are associated with keys prairies and Vineland, uh, Everglades National Park, Big Tree Islands, and Conservation Area 3B Islands. And it shows up when you just characterize them like that, that's what we have here, the red, green, blue, light blue, that's what I, I just said. This is also, the characterization here comes from a we ran a classification pr procedure on the data as well, and so it shows that these communities are pretty distinct, and that's why we found range boundary clumping. And this is, um, so this is sort of a Clementsian view of, of communities. There's, there's specific communities and they all, uh, they, they rather than just one grading into the other evenly. So this is what we found from this metadata. And remember I said that the uh, species number and species area were, and, and hammock area were, were very strongly related. If you look at the sizes of the islands here graphically, you can see that these, these little fragments in the middle of the Everglades are tiny, they're less than one hectare in size, whereas the units out in the prairie are quite a bit larger, and then you have some really large units such as North Key Largo, where we've been doing a lot of work. So this area effect is, it's not only driving the number of species, it's driving composition, it, 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 in some sense it's driving the composition as well. And there, there are other geographic variables that we looked at. We looked at the distance to the Keys, thinking that the Keys is sort of a source of these tropical species, or, and then the distance would have to do with um, seed dispersal and so on over centuries and thousands of years. 
and we look at uh, the proximity of neighboring islands would affect the immigration rates. And we also looked at the, the mean minimum January temperatures, but all these variables are correlated with, they're very strongly intercorrelated. So the, the January, you can see that the January temperatures run like this, and that's, that's almost identical to the distance to the peaks, and it's also going to be related to this island size. So the, it's pretty hard to tease things out just from these, these uh, geographic variables. So there's a limited uh, amount of things you can learn without, ju just from looking at this, look, looking at, at it in this broad way that we are. So we have to dig in further and look at the species, what species they are, and what their characteristics are. And to do that, you, uh, it helps to work in, in a concentrated, a, a smaller area. And so we've concentrated a lot of our effort in Key Largo. So this is Key Largo. Uh, this one shows the whole, Key Lar whole North Key Largo. You can see the hammock running down. The dark green here is hammock. This is all man wide mangrove forest down here. There's a narrow buttonwood zone, and then you have mangroves along this edge uh, here. So, but this is a pretty continuous uh, forest. It's a fossil coral reef. So this, you know, 150,000 years ago, this was a coral reef, and the mainland of Florida was further, further back. Um, and and this is also sort of the higher elevation. This is the ridge that runs down the center. But the, the Key Largo has a human history as well. And it was farmed pretty intensively um, <coughs> early, you know, er, earlier on than we really have photos. But this is a 1940 photo, and you can see how much farming is going on here. This, these are all cleared hammocks right here, right here. There's a little patch of hammock that wasn't cleared there. This is all cleared area. Um, and they were growing um, lime tree, fruit trees, lime trees, pineapples. I don't know, it's hard, I haven't, uh, there, there's really nobody that's got a lot of information about, about what they were growing up there and what their farming practices uh, were. I, I think that's an area that would be <coughs> Interesting for somebody to dig into uh, just exactly what they what they did in order to grow things on this limestone rock in the Keys. So anyway, it's got this history of of disturbance of you know major disturbance, and then after it's abandoned from that activity, uh, trees come in, and so you you end up with a gradient of, of ages of, of uh, forests there, and that's a chrono sequence that we can actually look at and try to understand more about forest succession. Because it's all limestone, it's all the same substrate, it's had different history. After this, when farming fell off, they, there was a lot of perspective development there. They thought they were going to build, you know, a, a new Venice. Or, uh, and, and that happened later. And then there was also a period where uh, Cuban <coughs> Missile Crisis days, they were, uh, there was all kind of uh, installations up here for launching or protecting or something. But there, there's quite a bit of that in Key Largo, which happened in the 1960s, early 60s. So in any case, from this, 
we wrote a paper many years ago looking at the at, the, at how the Key Largo forest, the variation in the composition of Key Largo forest, the most important variable, we look, we had some elevations, we had a geographic variable, but stand age was the, the most important variable in determining what the composition of a particular piece of forest <coughs> was. Uh, and then from from this, we could look at species positions along the stand age gradient, and then we could arrange them that the species that are out here are the late successional species. They're only in the oldest stands. The species that are over here are only in the youngest stands. So we arrange them here just like that. So Guitarda scabra is the early, early successional species, and Drypedes lateriflora folia is the late successional species. And then it was, it, interestingly enough, it, it seemed that most of the early successional species were deciduous species, and the late successional species were evergreen species. So that um, I think was an interesting finding, and it's more like a clue as to what's actually changes over time in that ecosystem, but we haven't figured that out completely yet. And that's some of the work that we're doing, particularly Suresh is working on. Okay, when I, now when I made the same kind of uh, matrix for Key Largo, this is it. This is, I range species along the environmental gradient that comes from the ordination. And sure enough, we get all the, the late successional species are on this side, the early successional species are on this side, the old forest are here, the young forest are here, but there's not a lot of coherence in this matrix. So we don't know exactly what this, means, except we're going, the, the first study was at a scale of the whole region, and we're just looking at, we're looking at, we found a lot of structure in, ge in geography there. Here, this is a very small area where there's sort of free movement of seeds, and the, the immigration and, and extinction here is all within one fragment, even though it's a reasonably large fragment. And so this is interesting, and we don't know, we don't know exactly what to make of it yet, but there's, you get a strong gradient with age, but it's not a whole lot of uh, spatial structure there. But still, the stand age the relationship between stand age and species composition is strong enough that we can use it to predict so that we can go and if we know that we don't know the age of something or its successional age, but we know its composition, we can say what it is. It's the same, this weighted averaging uh, calibration and regression procedure that's used mainly in paleoecology to interpret what sort of environmental conditions happened in the past when all you know is the composition of, of pollen or diatoms or mollusks. Um, we're using, we can use, this. there's a strong enough relationship between age and composition that we can use this as a predictive tool. So that's what we're, we did this. This shows. This has the so so from the tool. You can you can. From from the vegetation, you can get an inferred stand age. If, if you know the composition, run it, but through this calibration and regression procedure. So then we can apply that to different, different, 
groups of species. For instance, we can apply it to the to the canopy species, all the species that are in the that are trees in that forest, and we can compare their inferred age to the composition of the seedlings in that forest. We get an inferred age from them, and that's what we did here. So this in, uh, inferred uh, stand age seedlings minus trees. So you find that the seedling uh, cohort uh, tell, it, it has a much <coughs> later successional signature than the tree cohort which kind of makes sense. Well, these are going to be the next forest, and that's a later age. So this, this is what we found here. This is all based on data from the same time we did the original thing. This is based on 1994. This is, we, we worked uh, right after Hurricane Andrew, and we, we had transects and we had the composition and we had live trees and dead trees and we also had seedling composition. So this is based on that data. Now we, we resampled that, um, those same transects now, 20 years later. And so now I'm just comparing the tree composition to the, in 1994, to the tree composition in 2013. Well, we have this, we've shown a successional gradient, so it ought to move forward an equivalent amount of years, right? And many stands do. So this is a distribution of, <coughs> of we calculate the difference in inferred stand age for a for the 1994 and the 2013. 2013 minus 1994. And this is a frequency um, histogram of, of uh, how many five stands have an inferred stand age that's between 10 and 15 years older than what it was 19 years ago. Four stands are just what you'd expect, 15 to 20 years. But then there's a few stands down here that actually <coughs> regress. And so this is a mystery that we have to look at exactly which stands these are and try to figure out what's going on here. We have we just got this data recently, so. Um, one thing about, you know, the succession, it does, it isn't necessarily a linear thing going